So, um, Gordon uh, will be pleased to answer your question. If I will take the question by a set of three. If you can introduce yourself also, it will make it easier. And if you can a short question also. So, any question? Will? Uh, I suggest that you just speak loud. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, Wim Althoff, I'm um, working at DEFCO and I uh, do the Ethiopia program and obviously uh, the Hungary uh, also refers to Ethiopia. Um, if, I, um, if I look at the, uh, the title of your presentation, can we feed the world and you give a yes answer, but the first part, can we also reduce the number of hungry? Um, that's uh, where I would like to, to get your opinion. You, you seem to assume that um, the number of hungry will reduce by giving more um, nutritious food uh, to the world and by creating more employment in rural areas. If I look at Ethiopia, where holdings are very, very small in the number of cases, where the rural population density is high, where urbanization will increase in the years to come, where we have two and a half million people adding to the, to the number of people every year, um, don't we also need other mechanisms, mechanisms whereby people earn more money, and don't you find them also outside the, the rural areas? Thank you very much, Ben. Um, yes? Uh, Hugh Williams from DEFCO. You, you talked earlier about um, golden rice and golden bananas, which suggested genetic modification. Is that mm -hmm. a technique you think is useful? We are going to take a third question, if there is some. Okay, no, they are at the end of the, of the room. Yes? Uh, when I would like to know if the study also tackled the issue of uh, you were talking about using NGOs to modify the uh, organisms. And if the study has done any research also on which effects that will have in, in nature, in, in general, or even in health, as there is a big discussion on the use of these genetically modified uh, issues. Okay. Right, uh, William, I think two points to make there. One is, um, I think in much of Africa, if you've got about a hectare, you could just about produce enough food for your family and sell a surplus. Uh, you know, that's possible. You can see it in Malawi and elsewhere. Once it starts getting much below a hectare, you, you've got real difficulties, even though the Chinese did it with much smaller land areas. And I think that eventually we're going to see consolidation of land as, as we go forward, and, and, and that's going to be the answer into the future. Although I don't think it'll happen quickly, I think it will happen, just as it has in Vietnam and elsewhere. But I think the other point we make is about how people get out of poverty, and I, I, I like this um, work, and we talk about it, of a man called um, um, Krishna, who's a, an American of Indian extraction, who's worked in India and in Africa, uh, basically going to villages and asking them how they got out of poverty. Uh, and it turns out that there are various ways they get out of poverty, but really in many ways the most important is the link with the urban area. If you've got a good link with an urban area, it may be that you're selling some, some food for an urban area. Or it may be you've got an uncle or a cousin or something who can present, send some money or can take your son or daughter to look after them in the urban area and they can send money back. That's really where the, the big shift is going to occur in poverty in the rural areas. It's that link with the urban area. And I think uh, that's what we need to keep building up is all those various linkages there. Um, two questions about GM. That's, that's very high by comparison with speeches in England or, or the USA. Um, yeah, I think GM crops into the future will have uh, a role to play. Uh, they're not a magic bullet. They don't solve all the problems. Uh, I think we're going to need them, certainly if we're going to have nitrogen-fixing rice and nitrogen-fixing wheat. Uh, we've got new GM um, varieties being tested in Africa uh, particularly uh, for drought tolerance, uh, which are, are really quite interesting if they work. Um, quite a number of African countries have got uh, uh, investment in, in, in 
geo technology. Uganda is the, the example. Uh, they got uh, they're trying at least uh, six or seven different crops and about a dozen different traits. Uh, they're well ahead of any other country in Africa, including Egypt and uh, South Africa, in GM technology. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big debate still about uh, whether GM is harmful to human beings or not, despite the fact that people have been eating them for 20 years in the United States. I lived there for seven years, and you, if you live in the United States, uh, uh, you, you eat GM foods every day, and of course here in Europe, we're eating uh, livestock products based on uh, GM, soya, and so on, all the time. And we don't talk about it, but that's what's happening. Uh, I don't think there's a health problem. Um, I, from all the evidence I've seen, I can't see any evidence of, of, of a health problem that's been well established. I think the, the, big, uh, the big concern is over the movement of, of uh, genes into wild relatives. Um, and there have been examples of that. They've mostly not lasted more than about a generation. Um, I think that's something that is the reason why we need more field trials. Um, and that's what I'd like to see happen. So, thank you, Jordan. Um, more questions? What there? Uh, yes, sir. thank you for the presentation of what depends in the Asia directly dealing with regional cooperation. You mentioned the link with climate change and you mentioned the need uh, for uh, to take some maybe part of forested area. Uh, you know that uh, there is a big effort to reduce deforestation. At the moment, agriculture is the largest uh, contributor or driver of deforestation. So um, how can we, I mean, can we solve the problems that you, you raised, the better nutrition, keeping the, the same forest area or, or reducing it as quick as we can because we have a target to reduce it completely to zero by 2030 and to 50% reduction by 2020. How do you look at those things in the overall equation? Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Maud. Uh, uh, hi, Maud, working for Commissioner Peabats on food security issues. I have a question about the level of commitment of all partners, uh, and I was wondering to, to, to have your views about um, how do you explain that the level of commitment of our African partners on food security issues are not as high as they should be? And what could you or what could we do to have them on board as much as it should? Thank you very much. I saw that there was a... Uh... Yes. Placido Hernandez from uh, DEFCO dealing with uh, urban development matters. In relation with the issue of deforestation, if you have considered in your studies the, the issue of long-term population growth, which goes mostly to the urban areas, or rural became in urban areas, and the pressure that, the, uh, that it makes in the environment. The long-term issue of stabilization population growth is one element to that <coughs> Okay, uh, if I gave the impression that I was in favor of deforestation, I think that was, that was wrong, no, sorry. Um, you know, we, we, we have to stop the deforestation in the, in, particularly in the Amazon and the Congo and also parts of uh, Southeast Asia. I mean, it's crucial that we do that uh, for two reasons. One, of course, is biodiversity. We need to preserve that biodiversity. But the second is, is simply about the climate. I mean, the rainfall patterns in, in, in South America are determined by the, Cong by the Amazon. I was going to say by the Congo, they probably are too, but they're, they're determined by the Amazon. If you cut the Amazon down, uh, the, the, um, the rest of, 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 of Brazil will suffer from lack of rainfall. And, and it's as simple as that. And uh, there's some recent studies, for example, showing that the forests of Burma are really affecting uh, rainfall in, in southwest China, and if the Chinese keep persuading the Burmese to cut down the timber to ship to China, they're going to suffer along the way. Um, the issue around commitment, I mean, I think there are a significant number of countries now that are committed to food security. Um, you, you take a, a swathe across, you take um, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, 
you take uh, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, I guess, um, um, and and then move across into Ethiopia and and, uh, and Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, down through Malawi, um, Zambia, Mozambique. You've got leaders, and I've been working with some of them. Who I was in Mozambique two weeks ago, and, and the Minister of Agriculture, Jose Pacheco, has got some very clear ideas about the agricultural development there. I mean, the big problem, of course, is how you do that agricultural development in Mozambique, given the fact they've just discovered that they are going to be the centre of both coal and gas production into the future. I mean, the first coal was shipped to Britain last week from Mozambique. Uh, the coal just lies on the surface. You just dig it up and put it in bags and put it on a boat and send it. And the gas is the largest offshore gas field in, in, in the world, probably. Nobody quite knows. But how you balance that with agricultural development in Mozambique is going to be very tough because of the conflicting demands. But we've seen uh, what's happened in Malawi. It's not perfect, but we've seen the increase in production there. I think we've got really good commitments from people like um, Museveni in Uganda, from Kagame in, in, in Rwanda and so on, and, and from the leadership in uh, Goodluck Johnson in Nigeria. I think there are those countries. I think there are some countries where there isn't much, but at least there's, you know, there's at least a dozen countries that you can work with. And I think you just have to keep reinforcing this point, making the importance of agriculture as part of development and the rural economy, of building up healthy, nutritious people if you want to build up the urban and industrial development, which brings me to the last question. I mean, I think the biggest challenge is going to be in Africa, because the African population is increasing so fast at the moment. It'll probably slow down eventually, but it is increasing very fast. And uh, it's becoming an increasingly urban country with very little uh, industrial manufacturing capacity at the moment. I mean, at some time in the future, when China becomes only interested in, in uh, tertiary services, as it were. <laughs> I mean, African countries will be the places that make the televisions and the cars and everywhere else. And I don't know how long that's going to be. That's one of the problems. Um, two decades, maybe, three. Uh, but those transitions all happened in the past in other countries. And everybody said, you know, you remember when, when the Japanese all started producing electronic, they said, oh, they're just copycats, you know. And then the Chinese started doing it, you say, oh, it's, it's all cheap, terrible manufacture. And of course, it changes. Countries change dramatically. And I think that'll happen in Africa. The trouble is, it's not really going to start happening dramatically for another couple of decades. And then you've got this huge population of youth. That's the big challenge in Africa. Millions of young people with no jobs and nothing to do. And I don't have a simple answer to that. Obviously, the more we can get agriculture to grow and the more you can get rural economy, rural industries to grow, even if it's only making beer, it's going to be something. And you get young people making beer, it's probably a good thing to do. I think people who make beer don't drink it, is that right? <laughs> no. Well, it seems that we have the rural economy passing by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. So, um, so then I thank you for your attention, and uh, I would like to give a big applause to uh, all.